Hello, hello, happy Wednesday. It's another Devs Operative stream, and today we have some awesome, awesome content. And it is Halloween week, so this is uh, our little Halloween stream. And today we're going to be talking about Rook. Ooh. Scared me of that. So anyways, uh, welcome, welcome to the stream. Uh, let's just double check. I had a, I, I, I'm being a little um, fun and playful today. So I decided to create a little, uh, a little Halloween themed slide deck. So I want to make sure that it um, is, everything's working. So could one of you do me a favor and check out the Twitch stream before we begin to make sure sound is working. We have a little bit of music and you can see us. Wow. Yep, looks great, sounds great. Fantastic. Did you make this all by yourself? Of course not. This oh. is a Streamlabs Pro theme. I just oh. was looking at some new themes and I'm like, oh my God, it's Halloween. And so I, I used it, I was like, oh, this looks good. I like the skull on the desk. <laughs> Spooky. Purple and orange goes well. So, um, yeah, today we are talking about Rook. So we've been using Rook for a while, and we're going to do a little bit of demo. We're going to do a demo of Rook, and we're going to talk about it. And with right. that, damn the Kraken. <laughs> yeah, are, are you going to transition to me? Sure. Well, I mean, okay, that, I guess. Is that the setup? What? Is that the setup, you know, or do I need to do my own setup? Well, I mean, that, that was my setup. I thought we could just uh, talk about it a little bit. And uh, yeah, you are running the demo today. So you let me know when you want me to change scenes. We'll transition over to you. Um, yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. I am in control of this stream now. <laughs> my name is Dan McCracken, and I am the cluster administrator of the Devs Operative Data Center. And at Devs Operative, well, we have business cases. We have business cases for persistent storage in Kubernetes. Oh, how many of you in the stream have ever needed to store something in Kubernetes? And you're, you know, you're great with Kubernetes, but it's like, man, every time I bounce that pod, pff, all my data, all my data's gone. Where'd my database go, McCracken? You know, that's what I get. That's what people call me. And uh, maybe you're hosting other tools like Harbor. That'd be nice. I can't wait to host Harbor. They're going to do ARM support very soon. And we'll be hosting Harbor in Kubernetes. How about Keycloak? There's something. You don't want to lose all your Keycloak stuff every time you bounce. That'd be terrible. All sorts of things. Postgres, all sorts of use cases where, hey, you're running a workload and you don't want it to go away <laughs> every time. Um, now, here's the, the beautiful thing is most of the cloud providers have solved this. Um, maybe we'll go into that a little bit. It's really easy if you're using a cloud provider. Today, though, we're going to talk about Rook on our our own self-hosted K3S Kubernetes cluster on Raspberry Pis. We'll get into that. Um, I've got uh, lots of activities. Uh, Makita, would you would you transition to my screen, please? I can do that. I'm a production master. Thank you. You're a producer. Boom. How does okay. that look? I try to make it fun. Hopefully it doesn't cut off too much. Oh, it's fun. Is it good? I'm not looking at it. <laughs> I'm checking. I need to see for myself. Oh, it looks great. Uh, our little spooky. <laughs> that doesn't look great. That doesn't look great. Doesn't look great. I'm getting there. <laughs> there. They nailed it. I like the little uh, bat hanging upside down. That's, that's pretty uh -huh. fun. Okay. Um, so, uh, what is Rook? Uh, Rook is open source cloud native storage for Kubernetes. Production ready management for file storage, block storage, and object storage. It basically does all the persistent stuff. Now, I don't know much about disk. I'm a pretty mediocre Linux administrator. 
I don't know what it is to like swing a LUN around in Enterprise Linux. That was a thing that I was told when I was coming up. Ron Sweeney used to teach me that. Thank you, Ron. I have no idea what it is though. And Joe Harnish, appreciate that. I don't know, but I do know that it's disk. And um, what Rook does is basically makes it so someone like me, we can be mediocre at all that hard stuff. I think it's hard, um, but I'm pretty good at cloud native and Kubernetes. I can have my storage and not really be a massive store, big brain storage admin. And Rook, the Rook operator does all the operating for you. It honestly does. Um, I had to learn a couple tricks. And I'm going to go over those things today because they're super useful, especially if you're trying to get started in Rook uh, or with Kubernetes persistence. Teach you the basics, teach you enough to get started. Um, it's not, a, and, and that's the thing, there's really not that much to it. Um, you really don't have to go that deep. So the way I think about it um, with Kubernetes native persistent storage is that we're dealing with highly available, fault tolerant, expandable, flexible storage that fits into a cloud native operations work center. Cloud native operations, Kubernetes operations work center. So like I was saying, forget about all that Linux disk admin stuff. That's not that's not what Rook helps you with, or that, that's not what you want to focus on here. You want to focus on Kubernetes native storage, stuff where you don't care what's underneath. You don't care what's underneath the covers. And so we're going to go into this a little bit more. So my original understanding of Rook stuff, and uh, oh yeah, if I'm missing anything, you guys can always chime in. I'd be happy to uh, to feel the question or a, a gap that if I'm if I'm missing something, but. I'll go into my original understanding of Rook stuff, or at least the understanding I got the first time Makita and I were partnering and we were trying to set it up. Um, we were learning a lot. We were learning a lot. I was at my in-laws place in the basement when we were setting it up for the first time. It was awesome. It was in COVID days. And, uh, you know, we were hunkered down and we were clicking buttons, setting up disk, destroying Kubernetes clusters and just like trying to learn what this Rook thing was all about. My initial understanding was that you needed to have a, well, this is what we're doing, a Linux host. You must have a disk attached to that Linux host that is clean, unformatted, which is like, how do, I didn't even know that you could like have an unformatted, I, I guess that's a thing, but you need to have super clean. Nothing's touched it completely. Am I hitting that point? Nothing's touched it, unformatted. And, and it needs to be, it needs to look local to the host. Um, and when we were doing that, what unbeknownst to us at the time, but now I'm teaching you, we were, we were setting up what Rook calls a host based Ceph cluster, host based. So again, you got storage, it's physically attached to your host. It's unformatted. Um, I'm going to circle back to this because there's another type in addition to host-based that I just learned about at KubeCon that we're going to maybe explore at the end of the stream. I don't know if we're really going to get to it, but I'll talk about it. And I did some research and I, I don't really understand it that well yet either. So, um, or I don't think it's a thing that I'll be able to use in our demonstration environment, in our lab environment today. So we'll circle back to it. But my original understanding was this host-based disk. And so, um, and so we at devs operative have a, uh, we have a cluster and we had a, a cluster of raspberry Pis, and, um, we had a use case where we needed persistence. We said, well, I know from prior experience, I need a disc attached to this raspberry Pi and it needs to be local to the raspberry Pi. It needs to be local to the Linux house and it needs to be unformatted. And I said, okay, well, we've got these little SD cards that are the local storage for the host and stuff. I don't really know how to leverage that for Rook that well, or for Ceph, for, for either. We're kind of, we're gonna kind of get into what Rook and Ceph and what's the difference. We're doing Rook Ceph today. I found these bad boys though, okay? I purchased it recently. Um, there's a bunch of YouTube videos that'll tell you about external storage for Raspberry Pis, and you can get big brain and attach all sorts of stuff. 
I just wanted something simple. I wanted something simple, something cheap, because this is just our little lab that we're using, you know, 60 bucks for a, for a drive for 128 gigs. It's like, okay, get a couple of those, plug them in. We can have, get three of them, plug them in, and we can have a nice little Ceph cluster. This, uh, this Corsair guy here, it's pretty good. Uh, it's metal. So it's basically a heat sink in and of itself on a thumb drive. These thumb drives are awesome. Um, they, other people stress tested them and said these are really good. Basically, you can find other ones, but they'll like melt down. And we're we're gonna run Ceph on three of these across three hosts. So it's already a little sketchy. It's not like we're using enterprise disk here. We're using a thumb drive, but it's probably the most robust thumb drive on the market that's at least plug and play. So I got three of these guys. They're awesome. They're really heavy. It's really fun to hold in your hand. And so we took these things and we plugged them into our, how's that look? We plugged them into our, our cluster. So this is our data center. And you can see we've got boom, boom, boom on a few of our, our workers, our, our hosts. Just plugged them in and Raspberry Pi picked it up and it was like, hey, here's some disk. Um, I happen to be logged into one of these. Now would be the, the, the time where if you're following along at home, or if you have a Linux machine at home, you could run some of these commands, um, to set up the SSD. Now I'm not going to run all these commands because I would literally wipe the SSD again. And I don't have any to play, to play with at the moment or else, uh, LBC get pissed. We don't, we don't want that. We're running real production workloads, people. LSBLK dash dash SCSI tells you what sort of uh, SCSI devices you have. I hate the word SCSI, but that's what that's, that's what that's called. It is a weird uh, word. <laughs> I hate it. I don't like it. I wonder it. where it came from. I don't freaking know. I mean, SCSI is a, is a thing. It's been around for a long time. It has to do with disk. It's a computer thing. We're not here to talk about that, but it's a SCSI device. And awesome, Ubuntu on my Raspberry Pi picks up or names it, gives calls it uh, SDA, which I think is just a the first disk that's added that's additional, blah blah blah. Picks up that it's a Corsair Voyager GTX, boom. So that was good when we were installing this. Um, you could do lsblk f, and you can see that my SDA device here. Is uh, has an FS type, which is the format. <clears throat> this guy's already been formatted to LVM2, blah, blah, blah. Goods galore. And you can see that it's got some Ceph volume attached, or it's 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 Ceph. Cephified, it's using it. Rook has taken this guy over. Ceph Blooster, this is really cool. I haven't really looked at this in a while. Normally, this guy would be blank. And in fact, if you're getting started and you run LS block SCSI and you're like, yeah, I got my drive in there and you run LS block uh, dash F and you see anything in FS type with that S with whatever matches up to your name, you know, you're screwed. You're going to have to start. You're gonna have to do the next command that I'm going to teach you to completely wipe out your drive. Now, the nice thing is this is actually super easy. We were messing with this a while ago and we were like doing it on windows and like Makita was trying to plug it in from his house when we had the cluster over there. And he was doing all sorts. Of, we were downloading weird stuff from the internet to get things to. You remember? I do he remember. Didn't like, he didn't like it. It was weird. And LeBlanc and I were like, no, 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 just download this virus and I swear it will work. And it actually kind of did. Uh, turns out it's way easier than that. It's another, it's another command. It's called SG disk. Uh, this is going to be scary. Dash dash <laughs> zap dash all. <laughs> This is going to be scary. Yeah. And then uh, I'm going to control C out. And then you would be like, uh, let me see. Slash dev slash. Uh, let's go. S start. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. It doesn't really show up here. Your draw. Oh, right here. Oh, it just printed out all this. Cool. on the file system that 
that SCSI device shows up under the dev path. So slash dev slash device name SDA. So you would do a zap all. Should put that. Where should I publish the show notes? We'll figure that out later. Put it in the chat. But it's a SG disk dash dash zap dash all slash path. I'm not going to type it because I don't want to zap anything. Uh, slash the path dev slash SDA. Yeah, just just blah, do blah, blah, blah. try root. See what that does. Mm. <laughs> so funny, Sam. So you do that and ls block f and you would see a nice clean drive there and you would be good to go and you do that on all three of your nodes or on however many nodes you're installing you could do you could do one you don't get much fault tolerance with one not much use to have an uh rook Ceph installed because you want highly resilient systems cloud native systems that are resilient can stand a couple nodes failing and your data not you know ever, your apps they don't care they don't notice kubernetes So that's the pitch to set up the SSDs. Right. That kind is way that. easier than when I was trying to figure it out. Right? You're welcome. We figured it out. Turns out this is all in the documentation. Um, <laughs> but when you're reading the docs for the first time, I mean, it's just hard when you don't know any what any of the words mean. And then like the fourth time you go through the docs, you're like, ah, it's right there the whole time. Which is why I get triggered. Not that... Not that anybody knows anybody like this, but if this is you, it triggers me when somebody, when anybody, blames lack of documentation. Now, this is a tangent because I have the microphone. Because I have the microphone. But if this is you, I want to. I want to help you. If you immediately blame lack of documentation for the reason you can't get something to work, or whatever it may be. Just think for a second that it could be you. Could be you. Could be what learning feels like. And just don't whine to me about it. Just tell me I haven't figured it out yet. Struggling. But don't blame. Oh, the Rook documentation's terrible. I don't want to hear it. I'm not going to help you. You know, that's that's kind of where I'm coming from. So if that's you, I'm trying to help you. Nobody wants to hear it. We, we want to just solve the problems. So... That's a little. That's the only McCracken life advice I'll give today. Unless you that. guys, unless, you, unless people in <laughs> chat are like, you do highly doubt that, don't you? I, I can't hardly stand it. I know. I have a sore throat today, so I'm gonna drink some more. What happened to the green tea? You're gonna be drinking? dude. I was working. I was working, and then I just didn't have time for green tea. I'm gonna have some. Get my chat though, and I'll be up all night if I dig it. If I drink some right now. Oh, you know, you could jump into one of my raids later. That sounds great. <laughs> um, <laughs> Makita hates it when I... Never mind, we're not going to talk about that. So, any questions? It is pretty simple. It's really... It's quite simple. I'm looking at the docs. <sighs> it's probably in the quick start. It's probably in the quick start. So yeah, I guess like high level, like you said, we're using Rook and we're using Ceph. Yep. W high level, what does Rook do? What does Ceph do? Okay. Definitely. That's definitely what we're going to get into. High level. Rook is the CNCF project that facilitates setting up persistent disk for you. It's the operator that does all the work to do whatever you tell the operator to do. So Rook is the operator. Let's put it that way. So if you're in, if we're going to do Helm install Rook, you're going to, you know, you only install Rook and it's a, it's still a blank canvas. Rook just says, Oh, cool. I'm in a, I'm in a Kubernetes cluster. This is great. I'm having a good time. Seth and I talked to, or at KubeCon, I learned quite a bit more about this. I'm going to butcher this definition, but, or I'm not even going to go into the history of stuff because I don't know if these guys invented this or not. I don't think they did. They might've, and kudos to them if they did. But Seth 
is a uh, block storage driven um, file system storage type backend that handles uh, handles blocks, handles high availability, shares between enough nodes, does quorum and things of that nature. You know, if you know what I'm talking about. So a Ceph cluster would be um, multiple nodes running Ceph that are working together to have highly available and resilient data and persistence. So there's Rook and we use Rook to, we tell Rook, hey, please create me a Ceph cluster. You could have it create all sorts of different stuff. In fact, you know, you could go through these docs and find other words you don't know, and it would build those other things that I can't explain. There's so much in here, uh, which is why I'm just going to give you the, this is what I know, this is what works for me to get you started. Because once you get into this world, it's, there's a lot, there's a lot going on. But it doesn't have to be overwhelming if you want to just get in with Rook and Ceph. With host-based storage. Very simple. Thumb drive, plug it in. Done. It, just like the data center. You know, you go to Best Buy. If you're in a big enterprise, you go to Best Buy. Just, pick, just take a USB uh -huh. drive off the shelf. You plug it into the, the big iron. You're good to go. People say disk is expensive. It's like 50 bucks. What are you talking, what are you talking <laughs> about? Okay, so if I understand that correctly, like Ceph is interacting with the USBs themselves. Rook is kind of asking Ceph to do stuff. And then also it's Rook that is making those volumes available to you as a user of Kubernetes. So when I ask for a persistent volume claim, is it Rook that's kind of the middleman? I believe Rook is the thing that sets up Ceph. Rook is the thing that will create the pods that do provisioning for your persistent volumes when you as a Kubernetes user or administrator ask for them. Um, we'll get into a couple of these things that you also install or once after you install Helm install Rook, you install two other things that are important. And the first is you, t you give it a CRD for your Ceph cluster in the case, in this case of our demonstration. So you tell Rook, please create me a Ceph cluster. And the, the last thing you do is please Rook, or not even please Rook, hey, Kubernetes, um, here's a storage class. Here's a Kubernetes storage class that taps into this um, Ceph cluster that Rook has helped me provision. I think that's the language that, uh, that I would use for that. And if you're looking at the screen, Sam, I don't know if you can see my screen or not, but I sure can. You can see the Rook pods, operators, there's agents. And then, you know, the operators and the agents are the things that then, once you once you ask Rook to create a Ceph cluster, Ceph is this red icon, fun red icon. Yeah. It'll then build Ceph managers, Ceph monitors, and uh, there's all sorts of stuff. RGW stuff. I don't even really know what that is. There's a lot of stuff. And then it just kind of does work for you. And you can be not an expert like me and still use it. It's super usable and it, like right off the shelf. It's production, production grade. That's what it'd say off the shelf. And we're running it in production. It works great. <laughs> it's actually fantastic. So, um, and it's highly available and resilient so that if you do have a problem, it's really easy to take care of it. Uh, you just have to learn that when you're faced with those things. And we're not going to talk about that today. Okay. So, um, we're still not ready for that. Uh, what do we got? Please. Where's my, where's my Rook? It's right there. <laughs> oh, right there. Rook God. dash release. Boom. Okay. All right. Helm users. <laughs> Elm search repo rook. Cool. And I should probably do a helm helm repo up occasionally. From time to time, it's not a bad idea. 
And what version should I be running? <laughs> One seven six. Okay, great. You'd love to see it. Manages a single Ceph cluster namespace for Rook. Very interesting. Um, I'm a fan. Also, I use this first one. I, the second one use case uh, I'm not not prepared to talk about. But it's pretty simple. Helm literally Helm install Rook with uh, Rook Ceph. Uh, that that is. Helm install Rook Ceph gets you going. Gets the operator in there. Once you get the operator in there, um, you can follow along in the documentation on their site. You don't have to follow along with me. But I pulled down their GitHub just because it was quicker. Pulled down Rook, um, Rook from GitHub. And you go to Cluster, Examples, Kubernetes, Ceph. And there's a bunch of stuff in here. A bunch of stuff in here. Um, and the thing we're looking for is cluster YAML. Okay. And inside here, so we've been, we've already installed the operator. Let me just install the operator. The next thing we need to do is give it the Ceph cluster CRD and configure that with our particular use case with our business rules or requirements. Our business requirements happen to be take all the defaults. Um, we want three monitors. That kind of stands out as something that you want to think about. Or, you know, you could tinker with. Generally, it's three. Okay, I'll take that. I'll take three. Um, and, and what is a mon monitor? Monitor is, I believe it's the pod that maintains the Ceph cluster itself. So... I think something to that effect. I'm not sure. Um, we'll, we'll take a look at the pods um, running in our cluster in a minute. And we'll, I'll kind of go over the ones that always jump out to me as being incredibly important, especially when they don't work. Spoiler alert. There's an issue in our cluster right now. We're going to troubleshoot it real time. If we have time kind of going long with this, uh, with this pitch, but you guys are doing great. Um, basically we're going to enjoying the this. Question? I'm yeah. enjoying this. Is this helpful? This is very helpful. I like it. I, and I, you know, I, I, uh, I enjoy uh, learning. I enjoy listening. So you're doing a very good job. Keep it going. Thank you very much. Um, once upon a time, our Ceph cluster in our in our um, environment wasn't doing so hot, and we thought it was because we're running on Raspberry Pis, which are not high powered, big iron. Uh, but it looks good. It looks look. I wouldn't mess with that. That looks pretty good. It looks like beeping it's you know you go back in there and it's beeping at you that's alive there's a living thing in in my data center which happens to be in my basement it's awesome and uh i worked with uh sova once and he was helping me and you can override some of these health checks because the health check kept failing go figure and we're like eh, increase the timeout <laughs> and it turns out that's what the internet recommends too it didn't really help so but this is where you would set some of these overrides is in this cluster YAML config. It's kind of the main thing. So set up your cluster, you, you install the operator, um, and then you have to take care of this file, which is the thing that says, okay, I would like this Ceph cluster on uh, this particular Kubernetes cluster. Okay. And the other thing you need is the storage class, as I said, which is actually buried deep within. There's a hidden message. We're already in Kubernetes Ceph, and then it's CSI. That's a thing. RBD is a thing. And storage class. And this storage class example that it gives you actually has one of these guys. It has a block pool, replica pool. And here's another Ceph thing. You can tell your cluster how replicated you'd like things to be, how replicated you want your data. Again, this is the default. Makes sense to me. We've got three nodes. We've got three um, monitors, three OSDs, three disks. And so it's like, well, replicate my data across them, please. So that when one of them dies, like it is right now, 
hopefully it's not too dead. Um, you nobody notices because we've got two others that are uh, that have copies of the data. But if you had more, then you would only maintain three replicas of that 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 block or that piece of data or whatever, however the terminology goes. And you know when you spin up another one, it would then just sprinkle stuff into that space. And Ceph just manages all that. You like that? Manages all that. Tough stuff. Somebody uh, with a huge brain uh, built those systems for us to use, and we like to use them as users. And the last thing that you have to do to actually create the interface, and this was Sam's question, how do I as a Kubernetes user or as a developer of Kubernetes, how do I actually tap into the power of the storage dam? Um, and that is we set up a storage class. And it's called Rooksef block by default, and it taps into our cluster. Again, because we use the defaults, this all ties together beautifully. The one interesting thing is, and I don't think we have it on here. Normally we make this the default storage class. So there's a an annotation on storage class itself where you can say, and if you remind me, I'll take a look at this in the live cluster, where you can say, even if, Sam or a developer of Kubernetes doesn't specify which storage class they want to use default and just use this one because I'm the administrator. This is what I want people defaulting to. And then they don't even have to know, you know, it's like, oh, where am I? I don't care. I just want disk. And they know that it's a devs operative built cluster, rock solid, zero defects, except this defect I'm going to show you. Um, don't run production workloads on Raspberry Pis unless you're us. Unless okay. you are Kubernetes certified administrators and can deal with problems. And you want to fix it all the time. Yes. Um, and then the last thing, actually, I said that the last thing you actually needed was the storage class. We also install this toolbox, which gives you a, a place to shell into and run commands from to check the health of your stuff cluster and stuff. Super useful. Do not forget to do that. Well, you'll eventually figure out that you need to do that if you want to verify anything, which you should. Okay. Um, I will note when you install the operator on slow devices like ours, I think ours are pretty slow because it, it took about 20 minutes. It took about 20 minutes for everything to filter in um, on our pies and on big iron hardware at in enterprises that we've installed this on takes about like two or three. So just be patient. It's busy. Question. It's doing doing lots of things. Answer. I have a question. Um, so you alluded to early on uh, in your introduction that, you know, the way we're doing it today is we have these drives, we wipe the drives, and we use those as, as Rook. Uh, and you alluded that, hey, there's a better way to do this or an easier way to do it. Um, is that something we can show live? Can we do that in tandem with what we're doing today on one of the other nodes that do not have a drive? I'm going to get into that at the end. The short answer is no, we can't do that today. Damn. But that is the next thing that I have here in my, uh, in my show notes to go over. I know. So spoiler alert, if, you, if everybody wants to bail, I didn't find the hidden, you know, the hidden secret that we were just like not doing something that was obviously easy. No, we were actually doing it really, really well. The host based disk is absolutely the use case when you have uh, on-prem hosted Kubernetes on your own metal, your own data center or whatever, that's what you should be doing. That's what you should be doing, I think. Or, I mean, that's what I've, that's my opinion. So I'm sure there's other opinions, but that's where I'm at in my journey. If you are, we'll just start talking about it. If you are in AWS, for instance, there is another, let's see, we'll get it. There's just a bunch of pods in here. Nobody cares about this. If you're in AWS, there is another host based cluster. Notice talked about that. Here's your Ceph cluster object with some defaults. There is another method. This is the thing that I was like, oh my gosh, this must be new. No, I don't think it's new. 
but I just happen to be paying attention close at KubeCon and notice something, I learned something. PVC-based cluster. In a PVC-based cluster, Ceph is stored on volumes requested from a storage class of your choice. This is a little, so let me just blow your mind. This is a little chicken in the egg from the perspective that I, I originally came from while I was learning Rook. So when I, when I read this, I'm like, I was probably, I don't know what the hell this is. I don't have any persistent volume. That's what I need. That's what I'm trying to use Ceph for, or Rook for. What, what is this noise? Well, what the hell? If you're in a Amazon or Azure and you're using managed Kubernetes, um, and Sam and I were looking at this, yeah, you probably remember too, when we were doing some work in AWS for a client, you would notice that there's already a storage class available. And we're like, oh yeah, cool. And it was it was called GP2, I think, which is, turns out, it's just standard SSD or standard slow. It's not, it's not anything great, but it's just standard disk and it might be attached to those hosts. And as a feature of managed Kubernetes on AWS, you get persistent storage already. You don't even need Rook. You don't actually need it unless you need it. But um, if you do know that you need it, if you do know that your business case is like, yeah, I'm on AWS and yeah, I definitely want Ceph because business reason, you know, you'll know when you know, I need, I need highly, highly available persistent data. You'll compare all the, compare all the ways you could accomplish that. One of them is Rook. And a cloud native way to do it is Rook. So, I mean, I, I would actually recommend doing that for almost anything. And there's almost no reason why you wouldn't do it, in my opinion. But the way you do it is by following this tutorial that I haven't done. We can do that for another stream um, where we, we need to actually spin up some more cloud clusters. So that might be a really good uh, future stream is to test this out. But basically, you need to manual, you manually create some persistent volumes using the storage that already exists, the storage class that already exists. So you would say, create me a few, or maybe you just tell this, uh, you do, sorry. You tell Rook, build me some persistent volumes using GP2 storage class that is in my cluster already. Make them 10 gig or whatever. Build them for me and put Ceph inside those. And then you make another storage class that references Rook, Rook Ceph. And it just so happens that you're abstracted away from what's behind that storage class. And then you don't care that it happens to be another storage class that references another disk that's managed in a managed cloud for you. And it's like, oh, well, that's kind of cool. It kind of blows your mind because I can't plug in. Well, here's, here's my simple analogy. I can't plug in a USB drive to my cloud uh, managed Kubernetes, but it turns out that those, those people are way smarter than me anyway. And they've already figured out, you know, you can do this. I'm just going to be creating a simple, Sam's laughing. I'm creating a simple analogy, Sam, to try and tie it together. That's how my simple brain works. And, um, that's it. So, I mean, Ceph, Rook Ceph will create persistent volumes and then use those volumes as the storage, as the disc to do more Ceph stuff in. Right. And it's, so so you could Crazy. still have your your RAID redundancy of like backing up the data between different storage classes. If, you know, for whatever reason that GP2 instance is lost, you're going to have it another copy on another GP2 instance. That seems really cool. And obviously right. your portability of being able to, you know, if you want to ship it over to Azure, I'm, you know, obviously copying the data over, but your whole platform itself, it feels like kind of gets more portable when you're just referencing PVCs. Correct. Like that. Your, appli your applications, especially. Right. Yep. You know, you can just bank on, well, I know you I'm going to be, yeah. I don't care which managed Kubernetes I'm going to be in, but I know I'm going to be in there. I know I'm going to reference my Rook storage class because my platform engineers told me so that it would be there. And I know that the data underlying is going to meet the business requirements or the SLAs of what that application requires. Pretty nice. Pretty nice. And it's all the same. It's, you just need Rook. And this, you know, you might have uh, a slightly different Ceph cluster uh, definition that you would install into Azure versus uh, GKE or whatever. Maybe it's yeah. possible. Um, maybe not. I, don't know. I know GP2 is Amazon though. So that probably doesn't exist anywhere else. 
So that was, well, there you go. That was the big brain thing I learned at KubeCon. I didn't realize that. And it's pretty awesome. But no, it's not a thing that we would leverage on your on-prem stuff. You would do it the way we're doing it. Um, the way that I that I wanted to read into this when I was being when it when I heard it for the first time was like, oh man, I could create persistent volumes using uh, local persistent volumes using the extra space on my SD cards that's hosting Ubuntu, and still get my Rook stuff stuff. I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's the case. Um, I could be wrong there, but that's about as much research as I did, and I'm not, I'm ninety percent that that's not a thing. It might be, or you know, some somebody can probably pull that off, but you know, that's not I'm trying to put my energy on solving business problems. I don't need to dink around with uh, making Rook do tricks, but you probably could, maybe. I don't know. Pretty cool, huh? That's what I call. Okay. Pretend like this line isn't red, but here's our um, Rook operator. Please. Okay, we're not going to be able to escape this error. So uh, here's the Rook operator. Here's the three monitors. They're very nice. They're doing work for Ceph for us. And then there are these OSDs. And these OSDs, I don't know what OSD stands for off the top of my head, but they're the things that really connect up to the disk. Object storage device? There you go. It might actually be the virtual device interface of some kind. Yep, um, it's object storage device. Oh, I'm so yep. good. Okay. Very good. Going. Uh, there are those. And then here's this tools that I mentioned. We will shell into it. Staff health, de health detail. Oh my, God. you hate to see it when this happens. Um, and we're monitoring this cluster. Where's Observe IQ? They're supposed to alert me on this stuff too. We're doing a poor job of monitoring this cluster. We have tools in place and aren't. Here's a new one. So apparently, this thing is mad. Um, what do you know? 33% of stuff is degraded. It's like one of our nodes is angry. This was not planned. So the other thing you can do is Ceph OSD status. And um, well, there you have it. Looks like node five is no bueno. Before we transition on to me fixing this, because I'm pretty sure I can fix it. Are there any well, questions in the chat? <laughs> keep in mind, um, it is 448. Now, I don't want to give you a time limit, but at the same time, I think we do like to keep our streams to about an hour because it also makes good uh, content for YouTube. Uh, but if uh, so, just keep that in mind. I don't know if we have to absolutely fix this on stream because challenge your presentation accepted. on Rook. Your presentation on Rook, I think, was uh, very good. It's uh, definitely a, a 101 getting started. And yeah, I guess my question is, for those that are in chat, are there any questions that you'd like us to answer so far? So one thing I was kind of wondering, like, what's a competitor of Rook? I've really only heard of Rook. Like, I know of a few competitors of Ceph, but is there any other projects in that space that kind of perform the same as Rook does? Let's take a look at the landscape diagram. Landscape.cncf. That being said, I, I have an off the cuff answer for you. And that's that um, when you're in the uh, public cloud, Azure, Google, and Amazon have native storage uh, integrations. Uh, for their managed Kubernetes clusters. So yep. uh, whenever you're in one of those, you can, by default, by just creating a managed Kubernetes cluster, take advantage of their storage volumes um, and have pretty much all the same functionality that Rook gives you. Uh, that being said, Rook uh, is cloud agnostic. 
So you can run it on-prem and you can run it across all three clouds without having to change you know, how you're doing it. Uh, it's, I do not, I am not aware of a, another open source Rook type thing. Yeah, so it's Longhorn. That's nice and big right next to Rook. Hang on. First, we got to look at this card down here. What is this guy? <gasps> That's us. <laughs> That's us. Oh, I thought Kelsey Hightower gave us a... Actually, <laughs> let me go ahead and say, looks Kelsey Hightower endorsed us, okay? Look. He's yeah, right, right here. You see his... Fit. This is good branding. This is good marketing and persuasion. Uh -huh. Devs Operative and Kelsey. Call us. Call me. No, just Kelsey. Look at that. Thank you, CNCF. A what now? Longhorn, right next to Rook. <laughs> Where? Okay, thank you. It's big, so that means it's big, important. Mm. Distributed storage. What Never is, heard of it, but what is uh, storage orchestration? Ooh, different. Distributed block storage. Huh. Hmm. Good one. Of course, it's enterprise grade. They have to use that branding to compete. Seems good. I would say you should use this instead of Rook. I'm just kidding. Don't use this. <laughs> Rook has graduated. Is that correct? Rook is. Uh, they're they're a real boy. They're full graduated. Uh, CNCF. It's my understanding. It's kind of cool. And a nice dashboard. Uh, Rooksef actually has a dashboard too. I'm not going to show it to you. But you can't expose Rook, it. Rook is a graduated project. There we go. Correct. Huh. I mean, this is a five-year-old. Well, this repo says it's five years old. Pretty cool. Okay. Well, Longhorn, there you go. There's a competitor. Or just another option. Aston, don't get me started. Oh. The oh. number one okay. cloud native, Kubernetes native backup solution at CNCF, specifically at that booth, but still, they were number one. The number one. <laughs> they had the most specific. I don't even know if Caston's that good a product, so sorry, but. They had the most specific claim at their booth. And I know they know that they put a specific claim on there. You can't, I don't know why, you're not going to fool a bunch of engineers with that kind of language. Uh -huh. Come on, man. Tomfoolery. What do you take me for? Tomfoolery. Come on. Anyway, these look like the only ones you care about. So, well done. Um... I, I could go reboot this node, but if you want to end the stream, that's fine. <laughs> it's up to you. Do you want to keep going? I mean, the host is down. Bring the host up. We have seven minutes. We are back. Uh, talk amongst yourselves. Uh, please transition to the... Uh... No, you stay right here. Stay right here. I'll be right back. No, I, I want to see that ping come back. Good point. Okay. I have the Halloween transition. I don't know if you have the stream still up, but... Uh, yeah, I do. It's pretty cool. I've been transitioning uh, whenever he goes on his long... Uh, uh. His long speeches, I, uh, I transition over to just him. Yeah, so... Um, how are you doing, Sam? I'm good. I'm enjoying the stream. I'm going to set up my keyboard after we're done here. So that's right. Yeah, we uh, were keyboard nerds. Uh, 
all of, all of our friends are into keyboards and we're into keyboards and we're thinking about doing a keyboard build stream in the near future. Just for the fun of it. Completely not cloud native at all. A cloud native keyboard build, of course. Thoughts? Still the thoughts are that uh, people think it would be really cool if we did a keyboard build stream. They do? Mm -hmm. The people. The it's person, people. actually. And for that, we thank them. We should do a graphics card giveaway. Yeah. <laughs> One lucky winner in chat. Hey, 64 bytes. That looks better. Wait for it. The light is green. Boom. Ready. The light is green. I gotta take my shoes off. I wonder why I went down. Let's look at the logs. Yeah, did somebody go in there and unplug that? It wasn't me. Kara. Kara. Uh, I told her. I taught her that one time. And there it goes. Beautiful. And uh, Kubernetes is beautiful. Kubernetes is pretty good. Pretty good. I love that the answer to fixing things in Kubernetes can be, have you tried unplugging it and plugging it back in? With a PoE hat, uh, Raspberry Pi, Ceph cluster, uh -huh. sometimes you might have to do that. It's not fixed yet. Wait for it. Wait for it. Hopefully. Auto out. That sounds terrible. Yeah, it doesn't look good. It doesn't sound good. You hate to Hopefully that drives okay. Oh, I didn't zap it. I was on a different one. And I checked it. It was way before I typed zap. So you can see it looks like it's sending data to it. So it might be catching itself up. Yeah, that's cool. Who knows? It's doing data rights, so that's that would be a strong signal to me. Especially when it, it exists. Changes. It's yeah, a yeah, real yeah. drive, guys. It's a real persistent volume. We're doing it. We did it. Why can't I clear? I hate that. Oh my gosh. Clear command not found. Who? Oh, oh baby. Okay, look at that. We're back, baby. Nobody tell LeBlanc. Everything's cool. Everything's fine. Excellent. With three minutes to spare. If only I could give you. you a gold star. Look at all this stuff. Look at all this. Look at all these bits. This is what a perfectly healthy Ceph cluster yeah. looks like, guys. Okay. Let's just helm install. So, hopefully you learned a little bit about what Rook does, how you could spin it up in home lab pretty easy, not to be afraid of some of the Linux disk commands that were definitely scary to me, <laughs> but they're not anymore. Um, it's super easy and you should probably have Rook as that shim between your persistent data and your workloads that you need in Kubernetes and your apps. So, um, I'm going to publish this, uh, to YouTube, uh, the full stream, but we can also include your notes, your show notes for those uh, Linux commands in the uh, description of the YouTube video. Or if you wanted to put them in like a gist or something, we could include a link to the gist. Uh, we'll put the, uh, I'll find this, the Ceph documentation. That's where I pulled them from. It's I think it's in the Ceph troubleshooting guide. Um, we'll get that in the uh, description. Perfect. And if you are watching this on YouTube, uh, please click the subscribe link below. Wow! And turn that little bell on. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, gotta hack the YouTube algorithm. <laughs> All right, guys. Awesome presentation, Dan. Thank you very much. I hope everyone enjoyed our little Halloween themed stream. And um, yeah, have a great holiday week. Yeah, we'll see you next week. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs>